Very long. I'm the um, the non-native species policy lead for the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. I work in conservation policy, um, but lead on non-native species issues. Uh, prior to that, I did spend many years as a field ecologist. Uh, so I, I am an invertebrate ecologist by background, actually an invertebrate marine ecologist by background uh, prior to that as well. So uh, I, I am a, a bit of a bug fiend. Um, and I, I guess what, what uh, we're talking about today is invasive non-native species in Scotland. And uh, so let me try and remember how to share my screen and I'll get started. Just to check, Craig, can you give me a thumbs up that that's working? Excellent, thank you. <laughs> right, I'll get started. So, yeah, um, we're here this morning to talk about invasive non-native native freshwater species in Scotland um, and obviously only the invertebrates um, uh, around that. So this is just what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, just give a background on what are non-native species, because I think it is quite an important starting point for, for any of, of uh, this information. Then the bulk of the talk will, will be just to cover a number of species that we have concerns about, uh, which uh, either haven't arrived or have only just arrived in Scotland. And then a bit about what you can do to help through uh, data recording when you're out and about and biosecurity for preventing the, the further spread either in by yourselves in um, uh, doing your survey work or the sort of things that, that are happening around Scotland. So what are non-native species or what are invasive non-native species? Well, let's take a step back to begin with and think about what are non-native species. And that's any species that's outside its native range as a result of some form of uh, human intervention. It doesn't mean species which are expanding or changing their ranges uh, uh, through natural factors, things like climate change. And um, there are around 2,000 plus non-native species in, in Britain. So from the animals we farm to the plants we grow in our gardens, the crops we grow, the trees we see in our landscape, a huge uh, proportion of these now are are non-native, but these are all beneficial. They're, these are things that that give us something that you know they give a service to humanity, and they're not doing anything wrong. They don't um, grow out of control. They don't cause any damage. So non-native species are not to be demonised, and and it's something that quite often this distinction isn't made in the press. They think that all non-native species are bad, not realising that most of what they eat is non-native. But the, the species, there are some species, about 10 or 15 percent of non-native species can cause significant problems either to the environment and native species, to the economy through the impacts they have on infrastructure or on human health. And these are the ones that we, we call non invasive non-native species. Now for the purposes of the water environment, the UK Technical Advisory Group lists 43 high impact species. And these are the species that would be taken account of in classifying um, rivers and lochs for the Water Framework Directive. So that they're what we use as a measure of the, the ecological or one of the measures of the ecological uh, health of um, the water environment. Of these 43 species, uh, 23 of them are aquatic freshwater. The 43 species cover freshwater marine and um, terrestrial plants that, that live along water bodies, but 23 of them are strictly aquatic. Of those 23, only 10 are currently present in Scotland. Um, majority of them are plants. One of those that, that occurs in Scotland is an, an invertebrate, and I'll go on to talk about that in a moment. So there are 13 other species uh, and I forgot to, to count how many of those are invertebrates, probably about eight, eight or nine of them are invertebrates and they're present in England, um, but not yet in Scotland. And these are the ones that pose a very clear risk of arriving in Scotland. And primarily that's what I want to talk about today, the ones that we really want people to be keeping an eye out for. So the first of these species is the North American signal crayfish. It's a... Uh, uh, 
native to North America, uh, but introduced as a freshwater aquaculture diversification in the 1970s. But when those endeavours didn't uh, take off, they uh, were either released or escaped into the wild. Um, and they're now pretty widespread in England and Wales, but only in small areas of Scotland. And I, I should say this is the map from the National Biodiversity Network. And there are caveats around this because quite a large number of those dots in Scotland are actually incorrect results. There are quite a few coastal coastal records from about 1900, which clearly aren't in um, signal crayfish because they date from before crayfish arrived in the UK. Um, but having said that, there are now more dots to, to add to that map. Uh, and so hopefully early in uh, next year, that will be updated and you'll be able to see a, a more reasonable uh, distribution. But why am I talking about one that's already here? Well, it's, it's only in little pockets within Scotland. The vast majority of Scottish water bodies aren't impacted. And so we really want to know where it is and um, keep a... Uh, a, a track of, of how it's moving to help us figure out how to manage the situation in Scotland. In terms of where it lives, it, it can tolerate most freshwater habitats um, and it spreads primarily through intentional releases, which are illegal. It's illegal to possess or uh, trap a crayfish in Scotland. But there's also a risk of spread as a contaminant of things like stocked fish or uh, commercial or leisure equipment that's used in the water. And its impacts, I'll just show you this, uh, its impacts um, south of the border, it's, it's caused a crash in the native white clawed um, crayfish populations because it carries a plague, uh, which it's not susceptible itself, but uh, is, is quite devastating to native crayfish. It can impact fish populations and it can destabilise riverbanks through burrowing. And you see this top picture here is some extensive burrows. And these are actually at a Scottish site down in Dumfries and Galloway. And so if you get winter flooding, it can exacerbate that because of the undermining of the banks. So these are the kind of field signs that, that we'd want you to look out for. Things like this, um, holes in the in the um, riverbank and also traps and as I mentioned um, trapping is illegal in Scotland so if you see a trap we would ask that you don't approach it or approach any people but to contact the police on their non-emergency 101 number and ask to speak to uh, the relevant uh, wildlife liaison officer because it's a wildlife crime. So now to get to the beast itself it's a big lad. Um, the carapace from nose to tail can be uh, up to 16 centimetres in length. It's generally this reddish brown colour and you can see on the, the uh, main claws there this kind of bluish uh, turquoisey blue white patch on the hinge and the underside of the uh, claws has this, this uh, red coloration in adults which is the, the so-called signal. I haven't included any confusion species here because in Scotland, other than in two particular locations where native um, uh, English crayfish have been translocated to protect them from the from the crayfish plague, other than those two protected sites, um, there are no native crayfish in Scotland. And so if you see a crayfish in Scotland, it's going to be non-native. And uh, as so far, all non-native uh, crayfish that have arrived in the UK have demonstrated themselves to be invasive. So you should always report it and, and not worry too much. The likelihood is it would be a signal crayfish, but if it was something else, it would still alert us uh, to act accordingly. And as always in these things, people always show you pictures of adults where they've got all of these identifying features. But don't forget that the young ones can be very small. These are the sort of things that if you're doing any kick sampling um, or that kind of uh, invertebrate monitoring uh, or survey work that you, then you might come across them and they just look like a little shrimpy thing, fairly nondescript and, and no defining colours. But if it looks like a little tiny uh, lobster, then it's a crayfish. <laughs> Uh, the next species I wanted to cover, I, I'm dealing with them together 
because they quite often occur in similar places and uh, they have very similar features. And these are the killer shrimp and demon shrimp, the two Dicrogamorous um, species. These are both gamorid crustaceans that come from the Pontocaspian region of southwest Russia. And um, the Pontocaspian region is something that in invasive species circles you hear about more and more, uh, mainly because they've spread through European canal networks since around 2000, uh, the year 2000, where the canal network was fully opened up. It's, it's created a pathway across Europe, from Eastern Europe to Western Europe. Uh, through the canal system and the associated um, river systems as well. So uh, both of these species were first found in Britain in 2010, so they're very recent arrivals. And un unfortunately, um, the, this Pontocaspian region is the, the source for quite a few worrying species that are heading in our direction. The top map there is the killer shrimp, which is now found in quite a few locations in England and Wales. The, the demon shrimp is uh, just in a few water bodies, mainly in the English Midlands, and that's the bottom map there. Both of them are absent from Scotland, and this is uh, these are species that we are very keen um, not to not to have. They prefer still or slow flowing water, so they're they're mainly standing water uh, animals, and they're normally found amongst um, uh, on to, on hard surfaces or amongst gravel. The, the key thing with these is that they can survive in damp conditions for quite a long time. So there's a big risk of them being moved around in things like boats and fishing gear and, and anything else that might be transported wet or damp and then put into another water body. And they're voracious predators, uh, kill and outcompete other invertebrates and even some small fish. So once they get into a, a particular standing water body, they can completely change the ecosystem. And this way, they look like, you know, um, on the face of it, they look like a, a, a gamorid shrimp, uh, but they are much bigger than our native species. These are, are uh, generally 10 to 20 millimetres long, but they can be as long as 30 millimetres long. So, you know, three centimetre long shrimp. Uh, if you see an adult one, you're going to know it's something that you uh, that doesn't belong. Their markings are very variable. And these pictures here, the top one is a demon shrimp, the bottom one is a killer shrimp. Um, so they have a lot of similarities. They have this kind of orangey, browny, speckledy, stripy look. They're, they're quite variable, but generally by eye, they look quite sort of brown, stripy. Um, the distinguishing feature is the cones on the tail. I don't know if I can if I can point to to these. I don't know if you've seen that. The, uh, towards the, the, the base of the tail, there are uh, two distinct uh, cones where other groups of species um, would only have hair. So you can see on, on both of them, uh, just towards the base of the tail, there are these prominent uh, cone spikes. And this is just a, a picture of a, a number of different killer shrimp with a scale so you can see quite how big they are and you see that even in relatively small ones you do start to see these cones on the tails. They can be confused with our native shrimps. Um, the top one here is Gamorous pulex, the, the, our most common common shrimp, which unfortunately has got his leg in the way, but um, if, if you look closely hopefully you can see that although there are hairs on the tail end the, there aren't any um, prominent cones. Um, and below that is Gamorous tigrinus, which, yes, is stripy, but it tends to be a very sort of dark greyish black stripy rather than, than that reddish brown. Uh, and again, is much smaller. Both of these are generally um, only up to sort of uh, 10 to 15 millimetres long. Both of the, uh, the, the killer shrimp and the demon shrimp are both covered uh, along with some other invasive shrimps and isopods in a, a a freshwater biological association identification guide and I've put a link to that at the end of uh, the, the talk here and I'd encourage you to look at that because there are other species there there as well which though we don't have them in Scotland or, or in England indeed they're in, in well not, they're not widespread in England then they're, they're worth knowing about because you just start to, to 
recognise what looks different from what you're used to seeing. Uh, the next species again come as a pair, uh, the zebra mussel and quagga mussel. Um, and these often coexist and they have many similarities. And you see the, from the maps here, the, the top map is the zebra mussel, the bottom map is um, a quagga mussel. But we know that the quagga mussel coexists with zebra mussel in, in quite a few places so that the quagga mussel map is is a, a gross underestimation of the distribution. I think because because of the way of their invasiveness, they grow very fast. So you have very large numbers of small um, animals and because they they look very similar, the likelihood is that they've been identified as zebra mussel uh, where the quagga mussel are coexisting. From a management point of view, it doesn't really matter because that you would deal with them in the same way. They behave in the same way and you would deal with them in the same way. So we don't worry too much about it. Again, these come from this Pontocaspian region of southwest Russia, uh, but these arrived in Britain uh, much, much earlier in around about the 1820s and they think that they possibly came in with timber imports direct from Eastern Europe um, rather than coming through the canal network, although they're obviously doing that now. You'll see uh, from the maps here that it looks like a zebra mussel occurs in Scotland. There are a couple of outliers there. You see uh, there's one up in Perth and one down in Edinburgh, and these are both coastal records which we're trying to get removed from the National Biodiversity Network because they're incorrect. They're, coast, they're coastal records which clearly aren't zebra mussel. Um, the, the rest of them that, that skirt the neck of Scotland there are associated with the canal network. And I noticed uh, Julia Johnson's here this morning, so uh, she'll correct me if I'm wrong on any, on any of this. And if there's any questions specifically about this, I'll, I might even defer to her because she, she's much more closely involved in it. Um, at, at one point, zebra mussel were found in the canal systems, but these are quite historic records and a more recent survey that uh, done by an MSc student before the canal network was reopened uh, didn't find any and they were specifically looking for them so at that point they were considered to be absent so all of the records that you see or majority of the records you see here are old records which um, are at sites where they no longer exist but in recent years there have been a few incidents. We've had one incident of a of a boat entering the canal network, luckily in a, a, a tidal flowing end, end of it. So uh, any villager larvae that were had come off the boat would have been washed out to sea and it was possible to, to sort the boat out without in, infecting the, the canal network. Uh, more worryingly, uh, in recent years, there have been two interceptions um, and these are boats that have been trucked up from the English canal network on you know on the back of trucks and were about to be craned into the the Scottish canal network but luckily the marina operator spotted it and alerted uh, Scottish canals who were able to work with the boat owner to get the boats cleaned before they actually entered the the canal network now they're found in in still or flowing freshwater so they love canals and they form dense colonies on hard surfaces so the kind of field signs that you're likely to see are these. This top uh, picture is uh, zebra mussel, which are encrusting the, the housing, the propeller housing uh, of a boat. And the, the bottom picture shows a, a quagga mussel on a piece of pipe. And this gives an indication of the, the kind of impacts that they, they have. They can be a huge biofouling pest on the holes, the holes of boats and if boats have been in the water for any length of time really interfering with with propellers but the the pipe uh, side of things can be really significant in England there are water companies that spend hundreds of thousands of pounds a year trying to clear their pipe networks to be able to maintain things like water supply so they really they really impact on operations um, all over the place so these are also the field signs to look out for. But to get a little bit closer up and, and identify them, the, the key thing is that they are normally small, particularly because they're invasive. If you were to find them in Scotland, you wouldn't be finding large specimens. 
So uh, these pictures, the, the top left is the quagga mussel, top right is zebra mussel. The zebra mussel, which is uh, Dreisina polymorpha, as its Latin name suggests, it's polymorphic. It's very variable uh, in appearance, but it generally has kind of bluish to brownish um, uh, and uh, yellowish whitish alternate stripes in a sort of zigzag or wavy bands. So I think they got their common name because they're a little bit stripy, therefore a zebra. Uh, the quagga mussel is usually more kind of stripes rather than than wavy bands. But because zebra mussel had already been named, they couldn't name it zebra. So they called it quagga, which was the next best thing, I think. Um, and they're only small. They, they reach. You're more likely to see something up to a maximum of, of about two centimetres in length. They can reach four centimetres and that bottom left hand picture there um, is a, a mature zebra mussel, but you're highly unlikely to see that in Scotland because they're not here. It would take a good number of years. They'd have to be established for a long time before they could reach that size. And so it's very unusual in the UK to find something like that. In fact, I think that specimen, I think, came from Holland. Um, so it's not even something that they could get hold of in England uh, as, a, as an example. And to give an idea of the size, the, the, the bottom right hand picture there shows a I think it's a it's a painter a painter uh, mussel down in England and you can see that it's encrusted with zebra mussels so you see the difference in size between our, our native uh, freshwater mussels and these things they can be potentially they can be uh, I think it's fairly unlikely confused with some of our native species this one on the the uh, top le left is a, a swan muscle but as you can see from the graph paper that it's sitting on there it's much much bigger and if you were to find zebra mussel or quagga mussel on it they would only fill you know maximum of two of those wee squares so it would be a very similar situation to what you're seeing in the the painter mussel down in the, the bottom right there uh, and but even if you were to find small specimen, specimens of native species, they don't have this striped pattern and coloration. So they are very distinctive when you see them. It has been suggested that I include this one as a potential confusion. Is, is our native um, pea cockles and orb cockles, the, the uh, spherium and persidium species, which if you've done any kick sampling in rivers, you'll be fairly familiar with. These are much smaller. They're, they're they're, they're listed as being less than 20 millimetres, but I think very often they're they're more like about five millimetres, you know, five to 10 millimetres across. They're free living in the, the silt uh, substrate in, in uh, uh, running waters as well as standing waters. So they don't tend to occupy the same kind of habitat to, the, to that extent. So I'm supposed to include them as confusion species, but I think if you, you look at the difference, they're, they're very, very different. And these are ones that we really want to know about because there have been records of them coming in recent years. They are something that keeps coming up from England. We're working very hard with colleagues down on the English Canal Network to try and sort out um, the cleaning of boats before they leave any, any um, English waters, especially if they're heading up to Scotland. Uh, to nip that in the bud before they get here. But even so, there may be um, more situations where we have to intercept them. So we should keep an eye out for them. And the uh, last species I want to cover is the Chinese mitten crab. And it might seem a bit strange to include a, a, a crab, but this, this one actually lives in fresh water, although it bre breeds in marine waters and it tends to spread, its range is expanding through marine spread. But once it finds a, a river mouth, it will um, travel quite long distances. And so you can see from the map here, uh, there are various coastal records of them, but then where they're on a river network, you can, you can kind of follow the line up that th uh, through river networks through in the Thames and um, uh, the Humber, I think they're in as well. In Scotland, there's only been one record so far. And it, it's not, although the dots there, it's not a confirmed record. It was actually an empty carapace that was found um, just a few years ago. 
uh, no other animals were found and there's no evidence of them uh, at all. So as far as we're aware at the moment, they're not in Scotland. But their pattern of spread tends to be that you just see an odd individual and then maybe a couple of years break and then you see an odd individual and then just it gradually builds up over quite a long period of time until suddenly the the uh, population seems to to reach a tipping point where it then then does suddenly become established so we're really keen to keep an eye on these you're much more likely though to see them in estuarine situation in the first instance rather than finding them uh, high up in fresh waters i should say um these are uh, as chinese mitten crab as its name would suggest it's a, a native to eastern asia it arrived in Britain originally in ballast water coming into the Thames back in the 1930s. So it's been slow to spread, but that's because it moves gradually up the coast. And as I said, it needs to, to reach a, a, a kind of capacity before it's able to, to form self-sustaining populations. Uh, the impacts and indeed the field signs are, um, are like the signal crayfish. It burrows into banks and this is a, a picture from in the Thames in estuarine section or the, yeah, fairly, a fairly freshwater end of the estuarine um, section of the Thames. So you can see they're quite striking burrows that they, they build and where you've got a big population, you'll get a lot of them. So the impacts would be the same with undermining of, of uh, the banks and uh, just the general impacts on uh, the local ecosystems. To identify them, they, they're very striking. They have uh, very hairy swimming legs and their claws have these very fine, thick um, growth of, of fine hairs that look like mittens, hence the, hence the name. Uh, and we don't have any species. And I know we have things like the swimming crabs have hairy legs, but they don't, they're not hairy on both sides like that, like this. They're a similar size to, to many of our native species with the, the carapace being Oh, hang on, I've gone the wrong way. Uh, with the carapace being up to about eight centimetres wide and they're an olive green colour. So from a distance, you you could uh, think they're, they're fairly similar. But the, the hairy legs and um, the hairy mittens, which even fairly young specimens will have these hairy mittens for the front claws, uh, are quite striking. Another uh, identifying feature of them is the the barbs on the the front of the, that run along the front line of the oh, of the carapace? And again, I don't know if you can see see me pointing, um, but you'll see that the the uh, serrate, the serrated edge on the carapace. Down each side of the of it, there are four there are four barbs. So one, two, three, four. And then across the front between their eyes, there are four. And then the other side, there are four. So this four, four, four pattern um, of the teeth on the front of the carapace is distinguishing. Compared with the, the native um, shore crab, Carcinus manus, which is beneath it, which has um, five um, teeth on either side and kind of three little knobbly bits in in the middle so um quite different but realistically the the identifier you're going to have from it is the the mittens and the the hairy legs so as i say all of these are ones that we're really keen to have eyes on the ground because we're because they're not here yet or they've only been occasionally seen they're not something that you can really set up a a dedicated monitoring um, system for it's really reliant on incidental uh, uh, sightings by interested people who are keeping an eye out just while they're doing their their normal work or leisure activities or in, in and around water but if you see them what we would um, really like you to do is go to Scotland's environment website and I've put the web address on the last page which I can leave up so you can can write them down or if afterwards you can just get Craig or myself to uh, to send them out if you if you don't manage to get them written down today so Scotland's environment website is a, has this dedicated invasive non-native species reporting page um, there are other ways of reporting through iRecord, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and a, a number of associated apps. Um, they're all, all of these re 
reporting systems are linked through to the National Biodiversity Network. Uh, so, and Scotland's Environment Web is the same. We're, we're all linked into the same central data um, store, which is really helpful because it means everybody sees the same data and it makes it much more useful and usable from a, a survey and management perspective. And all I've done here is just list, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with, because I'm, sh I'm sure many of you are, are already habitual recorders of, of wildlife. Um, uh, the things to record are the species that you've seen, when you saw it, uh, a description of, of where you saw it, uh, a grid reference. Although with um, Scotland's Environment Web, you can just uh, click on a pointer on a map uh, as to where you were, so you don't need to worry too much about the grid reference. You can just point and click. The number of animals seen and if possible, a photograph with something in the photograph that will help us and as a, a scale as well. And all of these will be verified um, on their way to the National Biodiversity Network. And I should say that for Scotland's Environment website, all aquatic species that get recorded get verified by me. So um, we do ask that when, if possible, when you record something to, to put uh, your email or something that we can contact you if we need to ask any questions about the the sighting just to help verify it. But if, if that was to be the case, it would be me that would contact you. And so we're all out looking for these things, uh, living, working, playing uh, in a near water. And so I, I couldn't not take the opportunity to mention biosecurity. Uh, you know, we all have the potential as field workers or, or people who take our leisure in in the water environment to be vectors ourselves you know we if you're out uh, paddling a boat or you're fishing or even if you've got wellies and waders on you can carry material from one water body to another so i would urge you to uh, follow the advice in uh, of check clean dry and again i've got a, a link there's a link just there on the picture but uh, I'll, i've written the link down on the next page um, and this is the, the national campaign, biosecurity campaign for anybody um, uh, doing any activities in the water environment to check your equipment, boats, clothing, anything uh, when you leave a site to make sure you're not taking any material, any obvious mud um, or plant material with you. Clear it, clean it off there if you can and just leave it at the site. And then as soon as possible, clean your equipment particularly where you've got nooks and crannies that are really hard to access and if possible you use hot water just hot tap water can really help and the uh, one and then the, the real key step is to dry everything for as long as you can before you use it somewhere else because things like the killer shrimp can last for a long time in just damp conditions uh, you know well over two weeks in damp conditions so unless you dry them out completely they're not going to be dead and you can find out more about that at the nonnativespecies.org website. And I, I'd urge you to have a look at that. There's loads of really useful information and um, things like stickers um, and leaflets that you can ask for. They're all freely available and you can just contact them direct for that. And so just to, to, to round up, these are the information sources. So the GB NNNS, which is, appears a lot in, in non-native species talk. This is the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat. Uh, they sit uh, sort of alongside DEFRA in England, but they provide a service to us in Scotland and, and in Wales um, and Northern Ireland as well. And that's nonnativespecies.org. And that really is the one-stop shop for any information on non-native species. They also uh, provide free online training. They have some really good e-learning there. If you look at the, uh, the the training button on their website, uh, I'd encourage you to go to that. They have uh, a, a big module on biosecurity and they also have identification modules for the terrestrial kind of riparian plant species, aquatic plant species, and they also have a module on um, aquatic invertebrates, which covers uh, the species that, that I've covered this morning. But they're able to do into a lot more detail with a, a lot more um, sort of detailed identifiers for those of you who are who are, are um, invertebrate ecologists and want to look at it in more detail. I'd really encourage you to do that. You get a certificate for having having completed each of these modules as well. So you can 
at, at least um, uh, give evidence that you've you've done this sort of training as well. Um, the Freshwater Biological Association uh, shrimps and isopods. Unfortunately, I couldn't give you a short and, and sweet URL for that, so it's quite a long one to look at. Um, but that's quite useful if you're particularly interested in the killer shrimp side of things and uh, are like using using scientific keys. Scotland's Environment website reporting, uh, that's just environment.gov.scot, get involved and then you'll, you'll click through, you'll see that, no problem. And if you want to see any of the distribution maps um, or if you're if you're entering data yourself and you want to go and see where your data ends up, it's on the NBN Atlas, so which is nbnatlas.org. So those really are the, the four um, uh, useful sites to go to, but the nonnativespecies.org should always be your first port of call for any invasive species information. And if you want to contact me, that's my email address there. In email is the best way to contact me at the moment, what with us all working at home at the moment. So that's it. Thanks very much. Hopefully you've got something out of that. And I'll, I'll get rid of this. Thanks very much, Joe. That was uh, that was really interesting, really informative. Um, great deal of information there that is quite new to me for sure, and uh, I would imagine new to a lot of our listeners as well. So um, I really enjoyed it, and I certainly have a few questions. I don't know if uh, anybody else will. Like like I said, you're welcome to use the. Uh, the conversation in uh, Microsoft Teams, the little chat bubble, if you want to type in any of your questions. Julia commented while you were talking about the zebra mussels. Joe said that you were spot on. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's good news. And um, I think you'll be able to see the conversation now. You'll be able to see some of the chat coming through. Yeah, um, no, that's it's good. It's good to know. Jules um, agree, agrees with that. Uh, they did a, a, a fantastic work with uh, dealing with that interception and yeah Scottish canals are some of our greatest allies in in this keeping an eye out and all the biosecurity and can and control work and all that kind of thing so it's great to yeah. see Julia. great to see Julia here excellent yeah so that that's my understanding is that uh, it's the Scottish canals network that are the the, the the leaders in if you will on the front line for dealing with these um, well, particularly the mussels, but shrimps as well. Is that fair to say, or uh, not as yet? Luckily, because we don't yet have the the shrimp species up here yet. But uh, down down south uh, in the the, the English um, canal network, um, but uh, with killer shrimp and demon shrimp, they've they tend to be in. Uh, standing waters. So the first site that they appeared in was Grafham Water um, down in England, uh, not long before uh, there was to be a, a big boating event there, which really pushed things to put biosecurity in place for all the all the international boats arriving and leaving from that that site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Rebecca's just asked Joe, um, what are your methods for control once found? I'm, I'm not sure what species in particular Rebecca is referring to, but it'd be interesting to know what the methods were for, well, for crayfish, shrimp and, and mussels. Um, it, it varies. Unfortunately, in an aquatic situation for most species, once they're found, um, they're normally only found once they're already well established because they're difficult to spot. Um, and particularly with crayfish, by the time they've been detected, they're already well established and if they're established in a running water body there there really isn't anything that we can do to get rid of them. Um, I mentioned that um, trapping is illegal in, in Scotland uh, and there's good reasons for that, there's good evidential reasons for, for that and there's, there's been a lot of work done looking into the evidence behind it from countries like Sweden where they're ahead of us in the problem. Um, if you start to trap them, the traps will. 
how to explain it. They have quite an interest. They're not just passive. They they have quite inter interesting population dynamics in that they have dominant males within a population, and the presence of the dominant males puts out pheromones which um, uh, inhibits the smaller animals from reproducing. So you tend to have it within a population of crayfish a relatively small number of species that are reproducing. So the the population can stay fairly static. Um, if you trap, the traps will favour the large individuals because they're dominant. They're the ones that will get in the trap and they won't let anything else in the trap with them. Also, people want to trap big ones because you don't want to eat little ones. If you want to eat them at all, I'm reliably informed they're not even that tasty. Um, but uh, if you just take out the, the large ones from a population, you've you've removed that barrier to reproduction. So then you get a lot of very small animals becoming um, sexually active at a much smaller size and that can actually trigger a population explosion. So people who say, oh, well, trapping will, will make it better, actually it can make it much, much worse unless you did such intensive trapping that you had all of us in a 10 metre stretch of river every day for a year. And as soon as you stop trapping, they're all going to come back again. So it's not sustainable and it's not effective in running waters um, well, and in standing waters as well. Um, so, And also there is very strong evidence from any country that's allowed trapping that it actually encourages even further spread because people don't want to travel to where the crayfish exist to go and catch them. They think oh, it'd be much handier just to have them in the in the burn just down by my house. And so they bring some home with them and dump them in their burn. And there's good evidence that their method of spread is is those sorts of introductions by people um, wanting to have them locally for their own benefit um, and then causing devastation to the environment. So to answer the question, yeah, once they're in a running water, there, are, there really are no control methods, which is why biosecurity preventing things from arriving and once they're arriving it, you know if we're unlucky enough that they do arrive that they um you need to prevent them from spreading any further and containing the problem and in the water environment that's pretty much all we can do there are methods for small standing water bodies which have been employed with on crayfish obviously we haven't tried it with the other species because they're not here yet um, and that is using um, basically poisoning um, an entire water body. So you can only do that in a very small water body where there are no particular biodiversity interests that would be collateral damage if you were to use that poisoning and where there are no linkages to running water bodies again because the environmental impact of using the, the chemicals would be so great. So it's only been done in, in a couple of places. Um, and uh, only in, in one successfully, which is Balakulish uh, Quarry up on the west coast. A uh, very small water body, completely contained. The crayfish had been introduced there by an individual who fancied having them on their doorstep. And uh, some really good work by the Fishery Trust and the local authority put a project together um, to, to kill them. But they're very, very few and far between the opportunities to do that that kind of work. So, which is why we're we're just so keen on prevention. Prevention is the absolute first um, line of defence. Yeah, I don't know if you just saw the comment that came through there, Joe, from Jane. Um, Stephanie P has worked on the eradication of alien crayfish population and has published guidance on managing freshwater crayfish. We're, it, are you aware of her name? Is, is... Yes, yeah, no, Stephanie, um, she doesn't work so much on crayfish anymore, but she was the first person. She she was involved in the first um, uh, trial that we did in Scotland. Yes, she has worked on them, but um, she'll tell you herself that it's only very small enclosed water bodies that they're suitable for. You that that um, uh, she was the, the person who came up with the the um, the methods that are used. Uh, but they're only suitable in standing water bodies. They're not suitable in running water bodies unless you can uh, divert a running, you know, you, you, the, the amount of infrastructure you'd have to put in place with a running water body and the amount of chemical, if you bear in mind, in a standing water body, you know what the dilution is um, because it's enclosed. Um, there's no water in, no water out. Oh, you can you can um, uh, block that off for the duration of the, the poisoning. 
Um, but if you're in a running water body, the amount of chemical you'd need to reach the level that would actually kill the crayfish, you would be killing an entire water body, not just the area that's infe infested with the crayfish. So, um, no, Stephanie was, was our advisor er early on in, in this, and uh, we would still refer to her to her work. Yeah, she's, she was uh, the, the leader in this field. Yeah. Um, a few more questions coming in now, Joe. Um, I'll start with uh, Susan's question. He said, thank you. Very interesting and informative. Uh, there seems to be a lot of cooperation and UK wide working. I imagine these species don't carry passports, which is <laughs> correct about. Um, so can you say anything about Europe wide cooperation to monitor and prevent the spread of invasive non native species? Well, you know, after Brexit, we won't be letting them in anyway, will we? So, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, there's, there is a lot of cooperation. Um, we have uh, slightly closer to home. We have uh, uh, cooperation through the British Irish Council. So that that in, includes you know, the, the Channel Islands, which is for some species is a hopping off point, although that tends to be for terrestrial invertebrates, things like Asian hornets um, and those sorts of species which uh, reach the Channel Islands before they, they reach the UK. So um, we've, we've got a, a lot of cooperation going on with them. <clears throat> and beyond that, through the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat, we have very close ties with Europe. Um, now, last year the year before I, I, I kind of forget my dates now because 2020 is as kind of I'm trying to block it from my mind um, but a couple of years ago a new regulation came European regulation came in on on um, uh, invasive non-native species uh, which uh, is is now uh, in in uh, our legislation as well and they actually are borrowed very closely from the Scottish version of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which uh, in Scotland we amended the the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 2012. It came into pa into force in 2012, um, and uh, that so that gave us the strongest legislation in in all of Europe at that point. Uh, England and Wales followed suit with a kind of. Uh, a, a, a similar version but it's not as strong still as ours but then when Europe was wanting to bring in this regulation they looked very closely at, at what we'd done in Scotland as an exemplar in in um, in Europe as to the way we were dealing with it and they reflected some of those approaches within the EU regulation. On a more practical um, note we work I say we again through the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat, we work with the European Commission on things like horizon scanning, what species are likely to come and agreements across uh, borders as to, to uh, the type of co cooperation that would be needed. In some ways, we're at a slight advantage because of having the water between us and mainland Europe that we don't have that direct um, border interaction that some of the Europe mainland European countries have with one another. But we're definitely looking particularly to Rotterdam, where a lot of these species, that's, that's the, the main port that a lot of these species when from the Ponta Caspian region, when they move across, um, their hopping off point to the UK is, is Rotterdam. So there's a lot, a lot of work done there. And um, we've had uh, border uh, campaigns going over the last few years, particularly in England, where most come in. But also, you know, we've done done a few bits with Inverness Airport, where anglers maybe go over to to uh, Norway and Sweden um, for, for fishing direct from Scotland. But most routes are in via England. So most of the work um, is done there. But we, there is border campaigns on things like ferries and airports um, for biosecurity as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's obviously going to be a, a, a difficult subject to to cover at the moment with the, the way things are going to be changing, obviously, in the new year with Brexit. Everything's going to be, um, yeah, well, everything's unknown at the moment, isn't it? So it, It's very much, I mean, we're, we're still, you know, we have colleagues uh, across the water that, that we will still know them and we'll still have their contact details afterwards, but quite how we will be able to work, I'm not sure. I mean, a, a really good example of how it can work is Ireland, uh, Ireland because 
Ireland works and North, Northern uh, Ireland and the Republic of Ireland um, operate, although they have different environmental um, organisations uh, for the different countries there, they, they operate uh, for non-native species as um, eco region 17 is, uh, is uh, how they, they operate. So they, they work very collaboratively on invasive species. So all the work we do through the UK Technical Advisory Group for Water Framework Directive and that side of things, whenever we meet with them, um, uh, they historically alternate whether it's the north or the south of the border that represent Ireland. So they, you know, they have a very close working relationship. So they've demonstrated how it can work really effectively. And, uh, you know, so we look to them and we look to the relationships between mainland European countries that have land borders and how they work together to see how we can develop our relationships um, after the 1st of January. Yeah. Um, I've had a message come through from Jennifer Dodd. Um, we have, th this, is, this is of particular interest to me because I mentioned this species in my talk yesterday as being one of the more common uh, shrimps to be found in garden ponds. And um, I'd be interested to know whether or not you would agree or would correct me. And, uh, and that's absolutely fine because um, my, your experience of uh, shrimps is probably a lot better than mine. But uh, we, we have Crangonyx pseudogracilis in Scotland. Have there been any records of Crangonyx florida floridanus recorded from Windermere in 2018? Have there been any records of the, the latter in Scotland yet? Um, uh, from, from what I read for the research that I did for my presentation yesterday, the, uh, the, the Crangonyx pseudogracilis um, is a North American species, if I'm not mistaken, and that that's one of it's the more common shrimp that you're likely to encounter in smaller ponds in the UK these days. Whereas the Gamorous pulex would prefer um, flowing or slow moving water. Um, yeah, um, Crangonic pseudogracilis, yeah, it, it, we know we have that in Scotland. It's one that I'm trying to remember now if it's actually been risk assessed. Uh, species where we we are, are concerned that they may um, have invasive traits or they may become invasive, we request through the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat uh, full risk assessments and those are done by um, species experts and they're peer reviewed. And so we can use those as as um, a very clear evidence of whether or not they're they're invasive. As if my memory serves me right, Crangonyx pseudogracis only had a had a, a a rapid risk assessment, which is a kind of quick and dirty, shorter version of it, and um, was found not to be uh, a high impact invasive. So it's not one that we take account of for classification because it's although it's non-native, um, it, it hasn't been causing any um concern um as a as a potential invasive um crangonyx uh, floridanus yeah we had an alert to that a couple of uh, a couple of yeah a couple of years 2018 at the time when it when that um was found in windermere i sent around to all our field ecologists alerts we've uh, all the labs had um big posters on the walls we've, we've printed them all out and put them on the walls to to make them keep an eye out for it and so they have been actively looking for them in in the, the when they've come to do the lab analysis um, and obviously in the field as well. I don't know the answer to that question, but um, I suspect the answer is no. I'm fairly sure it will be no, because if anyone had found one, they would have told me um, because we, you know, we would have some concern over it. So um, sorry, Jennifer, I can't tell you for, for definite, but I'm I'm probably about 95% certain that we ha we haven't found it. Certainly, um, CEPA ecologists haven't found it. And I haven't had uh, any records from external sources as yet. So, yeah, just to differentiate between the Crangonyx species and the Dicrogamera species, the, uh, the Crangonyx aren't necessarily as much of a concern in terms of their invasive traits. So I would presume that 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 suggests to me that they're not as voracious predators as the Dicrogamus species that we were covering in the in your presentation. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. I think their behaviour is much more close to our, our native species. The, the 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 big thing with the Dicrogamus species is is they 
they ha they have completely different um, behaviour. I mean, you know, I I've seen video footage of a petri dish with dicrogammarus, gammarus, a few acellus, and and simulids, and very you know various other invertebrates, native invertebrates from the water body that had been found. And within about 20 minutes, the dicrogammarus had pretty much killed everything in the petri dish. Um, including other dicrogammarus, you just end up with one big fat dicrogammarus very quickly. They, you know, they they are really when they say voracious pre predators, they really are voracious predators. So it's a very different, very different behavioural traits, which is you know what what is what makes them invasive. Yeah, that's interesting. I think um, I think that's one thing that would be quite useful to to look into as well is the identification of the Krangonic species, so the um, you're able to differentiate between the two, but I was very surprised to hear. I mean, I've looked at pictures of the killer shrimp and the demon shrimp, um, having uh, discussed the, this presentation with you a month or so ago, and um, I'm, I'm amazed at the size of them. I, I didn't think they would they would get to about an inch long. That's that's pretty remarkable. You you wouldn't miss one of them, would you? No, no. I think at the time when they were first found um, in uh, in Grafham Water. The news of the world uh, ran a headline which said Dicrogammarus uh, blinded my cat, <laughs> which was was later rescinded because it clearly wasn't true. But you know, I think I think the the, the press got whipped up into an absolute frenzy because of this thing being called killer shrimp. I think they had this vision of them jumping out and grabbing people by the neck or something. But obviously, they're not that bad. But in terms of the the damage they do to to an ecosystem, they they are devastating. Um, where they, where they become established they can be absolutely devastating yeah yeah um a question from doug uh in argyle what what controls are being implemented to prevent ingress by aquatic plants from commercial suppliers to the public um well the invasive um, non-native aquatic plants so things like crassula helm helmsii uh, lagrosiphon and so um parrot's feather um, New Zealand pygmy weed, um, uh, yeah, those sorts of species, they're banned from sale. And we work very closely with the Horticultural Trade Association across uh, Britain uh, to make sure that all of their members aren't supplying them. And uh, they, ha they also work with plant health side of things um, and the non-native species side of things to, to prevent when plants are being moved around from nursery to nursery that they don't have hitchhikers whether that's plant pathogens or invasive species because um, something like um, uh, azola I can never remember the I always forget the, the, the common name for it is one that came in at just as a hitchhiker in in uh, water plants and was never it's never been for sale in the UK it's only ever been a hitchhiker um, and so yeah, the, the Horticultural Trade Association are very much part of of the partnerships that are working across across GB uh, to look at this sort of thing. The 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 one weakness is the internet um, and internet suppliers and people being able to to buy. I mean, it, it might be the one it might be one um, uh, benefit of uh, import levies come January the 1st is that people may be less in, inclined to buy from suppliers outside the UK um, because obviously they're not part of our horticultural trade association and so it's much more difficult to police that but again the GB secretariat is working with the likes of eBay um, and Amazon to to help them in their algorithms to make sure they don't have sellers that are selling things that they shouldn't be. So that's ongoing and it's a huge, huge task. But in terms of nurseries within the UK, um, there's a lot of work going on uh, with the reputable su suppliers. We also uh, have the the beak plant wise campaign, which is also on the GB um, non-native species website. And that's about getting uh, gardeners and pond owners, but also um, garden and pond plant suppliers uh, to be very aware of what they're selling, very aware of what they're buying and how these things are going to behave and how best to, to manage them um, if you've got them in your garden or what have you. But uh, the species that we're particularly con con concerned about are banned from sale in the UK. Julia's just... Uh 
chipped in with uh, Waterphone. I think that was Waterphone. The... Yes, thank, <laughs> thanks, Jules. <laughs> My brain just wasn't working. The species you were looking for. Um, great, thank you. Uh, Colin has made a comment about um, a holiday that that he had in Lake Mead in Arizona. They have a big problem with quagga mussels. Um, and have rigorous inspection and licensing arrangements for boats and anglers, which is interesting. There. So the quagga mussels are from the, the Eurasian area, the, that that region in Russia that you were talking about. And uh, what's the what name? What's the name of the region in Russia? Uh, the Ponto Caspian region. Ponto, it's Ponto the, the, region. the area up by the Caspian Sea. I think most of these things must be in the, the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. And they've made it all the way to North America as well. Yes, yeah, I think in that that case, because these are because they're a, a whole fouling uh, um, and potential ballast water type species, they they may you know I, I don't know how they've got to America, but I am aware they have a a big problem over there. We do follow what goes on in a, in a North America, well in in America, but mainly North America as well. Um, and actually, the the check clean dry campaign that we have in the UK originally um, back in 2010 2011 was partially plagiarized from an American campaign, an early American campaign, which has been rolled out to to do exactly what, what Colin's talking about there. So, so we have links with America of how they had done this sort of biosecurity and we adapted it for, for um, uh, UK and, and Europe um, use in, and we call it the Check Clean Dry campaign. They have something very similar in New Zealand, they're incredibly r rigorous in New Zealand as, as well. So we all have very similar message, biosecurity messaging in, in uh, all the countries that are affected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just had one question about the white clawed crayfish in Scotland as well, because uh, again, referring back to my talk yesterday and the, the research that I had done in preparation for that, and uh, I, I understood that there was a couple of sites within Scotland that had white clawed crayfish that could be of some conservation value in supporting um, the white clawed crayfish population in England and Wales that was under threat from the North American signal crayfish. Mm -hmm. Are the white clawed crayfish populations in Scotland, the two colonies that there are in Scotland, are they under threat from the North American signal crayfish that's in Scotland as well? They they must be. Um, uh, yes and no. Yeah, the, uh, what happened was in the relatively early on in the colonisation of signal crayfish in England, they realised that, that they had this issue with the crayfish plague, and so yeah, there were two populations um, that were that were brought up to Scotland to make what they call them arc sites. So they were translocated to Scotland into these arc sites, which are are unconnected freshwater bodies um, uh, that are, are kept. I, I mean, they're reasonably well known about, but I can't say I can't say in public where they are. Um, although it's, it's you know it is possible to find out, but I shouldn't be telling people where they are. Um, uh, and they were put there to protect them from the crayfish plague. At the time, the intention was. Um, in, in England, well, we'll get rid of the, the signal crayfish and then we'll have some to reintroduce um, to, to reinstate the, the, the uh, white clawed population once the signal crayfish have gone. Now, clearly, signal crayfish were far bigger problem than anybody anticipated uh, at the time. You know, it predates my career. Um, and so, you know, they are now widespread and the, the white clawed crayfish po population possibly is doomed as as um, happened with the noble uh, crayfish population in Sweden when when uh, signal crayfish were introduced. So there are these arc populations so in theory they could if if we managed to find a silver bullet to that would um, stop signal crayfish from reproducing or whatever there's lots of research going on all the time all over the world um, that but nobody's managed to find um, this silver bullet as yet but if we do then in theory then then these white clawed populations uh, in Scotland could be used to help reinstate the white claws down in England um, yes they're at risk from signal crayfish in Scotland but they are not at imminent risk because um, they are not 
close to any of the existing locations that we know of for, for signal crayfish. And it's another of the reasons why it's so important for us to know where signal crayfish are and to make sure that as soon as we know where they are, we put in place much more rigorous biosecurity for water users. And industry, we work very closely with, with industry, like you know the water supply and hydropower um, industries, uh, water and sewage and all that kind of thing. Um, to, to look at all the different pathways of spread to try and prevent uh, further spread. We have to accept that where we've got signal crayfish in large standing water bodies or in running water bodies, there really isn't anything we can do to get rid of them yet. You know, but we, we need to just contain them and contain them and contain them uh, in the hope that, that uh, somebody can develop a technique that can eradicate them. Um, and just to give ourselves some breathing time, which uh, unfortunately didn't wasn't done in England. England allowed trapping, and that was one of the reasons why England is is um, well populated by crayfish now. We're not allowing trapping, and part of that is is because it helps to prevent the spread. And if we can buy ourselves some time, hopefully at some point there'll be a there'll be a solution, and hopefully they won't have reached the point that they reach these arc um, sites for white clawed crayfish by the time that happens. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. It's um, it's certainly of concern. I never realised that the white clawed crayfish had been deliberately brought to Scotland specifically for their, their potential conservation value. Um, I thought it yeah. was another um, incidental uh, introduction that had uh, resulted in that that potential conservation value. But um, yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Joe. I'm I'm really pleased that you were able to come along and give this presentation today. I've, I've certainly learned a great deal um, from from your talk and from the discussion afterwards. Um, there's obviously a, a great deal of um, information out there, and you've you've referred to a few uh, links there towards the end of your presentation. I'm happy to email anybody that requires that information. Um, I've written down the, the the websites that you would refer to there, um, but I'm sure if, if anybody needs those links, then please get in touch with me. Uh, the presentation has been recorded and will be live on the Bug Life website and the YouTube channel, hopefully by next week. So look out for that as soon as possible. Um, if before we lose too many people, I've posted a link to a survey monkey in the conversation. If you could spare a minute of your time just to fill in four very quick questions on that survey monkey, I'd be very grateful. Um, it helps us establish um, how many people we're reaching, basically, and, and whether or not you're enjoying the workshops that I'm organizing um, and also where in the country you're attending from as well. Um, whether that be in Scotland or England or Wales or Northern Ireland or elsewhere. So, um, yeah, if you could spare a minute to fill in that form, I'd be very grateful. Uh, lots of positive comments coming through now, Joe. So I do think that lots of people um, gained as much from it as I did. Um, I, I, yeah, uh, if there are no more, no more questions, it doesn't look like it. Um, but, Thank you. Lots to pass on to colleagues in the Ranger Service. Yes, that's, uh, that's good to hear. Um, hopefully this information will get spread as widely as possible and there'll be as many eyes on the ground um, looking out for these, these animals as possible as well. That's great. No, thanks for so many people showing an interest. Uh, it's really good to know there's lots of people out there interested in this subject. And yeah, I'd urge you have a look at the, the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat we website, and um, that's nonnativespecies.org. And um, feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions. Excellent. OK, well, with that, I think I'll uh, sign off just now and Thank you again, Joe, for your time this morning and thank you all for coming along this morning and attending and listening in. OK. Thank you all. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye.